there is common ground, but I hope that the subtleties are appreciated and we do the right thing so that we can truly lower drug prices without affecting innovation and development of important future compounds. How do you do that? Well, you have to realize that what goes on in Europe, where the Europeans are simply negotiating as the sole buyer of drugs um, and have prices that are a quarter to a third as low of the U.S., that doesn't give drug companies a margin for research and development. And what we might be asking ourselves is, in trade negotiations, why don't we sit down and say, you know what, American taxpayers shouldn't be the people who are paying for all of R&D, research and development, in the drug industry. You guys have to raise your prices so that it's at least fair for the Americans. And then we have to say to the drug companies, you guys can't pocket that money. So, but, but, but are you suggesting that zero innovation comes from the likes of Roche, Novartis, GSK? No. Yes and no. I know today that drug discovery is largely a function of academic medicine and the NIH generating the kind of grants and intellectual property that companies then will pick up, either by buying a small startup biotech or directly buying a license from an academic medical center. Big Pharma has become a development house, a drug development house. So we've got to keep drug discovery um, at the same time, we give the companies the resources for drug development, which is very expensive. Mm -hmm. The list price of a drug being displayed in a TV ad, which was just proposed or, or just discussed in that lawmaker montage we just played, is that a good idea? And, and I ask because the list price is one thing, but the price that consumers and, and healthcare companies are paying are totally different. There's no transparency around it. So how do you get at that? And how do you get at that unless you... I mean, do you have to target the PBMs? Does the whole supply chain need to be taken a look at? It's utterly naive to think that if we publish in ads or on TV what the list price of those drugs are, that it has any relationship at all to what people pay, depending on their co-pays, their deductibles, the insurance company that they were associated with. It's all completely different. And what it demonstrates to me is that we're not nuanced enough in looking at the subtleties that are associated with drug pricing and what we can do to address it. If uh, in a Mount Sinai hospital you provide a patient with a relatively mainstream uh, drug whilst they're there, something like an Advil or equivalent like that, do you make a margin on that? Do we make a margin on that? That's a very complicated question. Um, we have to have a margin for our, through our commercial insurers because in every Medicare patient who walks into Mount Sinai and every Medicaid patient, we lose a lot of money. We lose 35 cents on the dollar of Medicaid. We lose 15 cents on the dollar in Medicare. So our bills and the commercial payments, kind of a bundle, will include some prices that include our cost of drugs. So, so, so is there, I guess the question is a bigger picture question then. I mean, 18% of GDP is spent on healthcare in the US. Right. Other developed nations, it can be single digit percentages the likes of Japan and UK where aging populations it's sort of 10, 11, 12 percent. What explains for that big gap? We're discussing today drug pricing with you, right. but, but is there a little bit of something that everyone can do or is that there is one specific area you can point to that could well, knock a couple of percent of GDP? Fee-for-service medicine has been the most expensive way to do things in healthcare. It encourages doctors and hospitals to do more. We are moving away from that to what we call value or population management, where we get paid a fixed amount to take care of a population. Then the incentives are to keep people well and not to just keep doing things. So, so when you have a number of potential presidential hopefuls look into 2020, come out and say Medicare for all, do you think that's a good idea? No, I think that's naive too. I think you really have to ask ourselves, how many people are truly uninsured, about 5%, and how can we get them insured? Because a lot of the system is working pretty well.